Insurgent by Veronica Ross, Chapter 40. The Erudite Dormitory is one of the larger sleeping rooms in Amity Headquarters. There are 12 beds total, a row of eight crammed together along, a far, along the far wall, and two pressed together on each side, leaving a huge space in the middle of the room. A large table occupies that space, covered with tools and scraps of metal and gears and old computer parts and wires. Christina and I just finished explaining our plan, which sounded a lot dumber with more than a dozen erudites staring us down as we talked. Your plan is flawed, Kara says. She's the first to respond. That's why we came to you, I say, so you could tell us how to fix it. Well, first of all, this important data you want to rescue, she says. Putting it on a disk is a ridiculous idea. Disks just end up breaking or in the wrong person's hands like all other physical objects. I suggest you make use of the data network. The what? She glances at the other erudite. One of the others, a brown-skinned young man in glasses, says, Go on, tell them. There's no reason they keep, keep secrets anymore. Kara looks back at me. Many of the computers in the erudite compound are set up to access data from the computers in other factions. That's how it was so easy for Janine to run the attack simulation from a Dom's computer instead of an erudite one. What? says Christina. You mean you can't just take a stro stroll through every faction's data whenever you want? You can't take a stroll through data, the young man says. That's illogical. It's a metaphor, says Christina. She frowns. Right? A metaphor, or simply a figure of speech, he says, also frowning or a metaphor or a definite category beneath the heading of a figure of speech. Fernando, says, Chris, says Kara, focus. He nods. The fact is, Kara continues, the data network exists and that is ethically questionable, but I believe it can work, on, work to our advantage here. Just as the computers can access data from other factions, they can send data to other factions. If we set the data you wish to rescue every other faction, Destroying it all would be impossible. When you say we, I say, are you implying that, that we would be going with you, she says. Obviously not all of us would go, but some of us must. How do you expect to navigate Airy Light Headquarters on your own? You do realize that if you came with us, you might get shot, says Christina. She smiles. And no hiding behind us because you don't want to break your glasses or whatever. Kara removes her glasses and snaps them at half at the bridge. We risked our lives by, defe by defecting from our faction, says Kara, and we will risk them again to save our faction from itself. Also, pipes up a small voice behind Kara, a girl no older than 10 or 11 peered around Kara's shoulder. Her black hair is short, like mine, and a halo of frizz surrounds her head. We have useful gadgets. Christina and I exchange a look. I say, what kind of gadgets? They're just prototypes, Fernando says, so there's no need to scrutinize them. Scrutiny's not really our thing, says Christina. Then how do you make things better, says the little girl. We don't really, Christina says, sighing. They kind of just keep getting worse, the little girl nods. Entropy. What? Entropy, she chirps. It's a theory that all matter in the universe is gradually moving toward the same temperature, also known as heat death. Elia, Kara says, that is a gross oversimplification. Elia sticks out her tongue at Kara. I can't help but laugh. I've never seen one of the erudites stick out her tongue before. But then again, I haven't interacted with many young erudites, only Janine and the people who work for her, including my brother. Fernando crouches next to one of the beds and takes out a box. He digs inside it for a few seconds, then picks up a small round disc. It is made of a pale metal that I saw often in Erudite headquarters, but I have never seen anywhere else. He carries it toward me on his palm. When I reach for it, he jerks it away from me. Careful, he says. I brought this from headquarters. It's not something we invented here. Were you there when they attacked Candor? Yes, I say. Right there. Remember when the glass shattered? Were you there? I say, narrowing my eyes. No. They recorded it and showed the footage at Erudite headquarters, he says. Well, it looks like the glass shattered because they shot at it. But that's not really true. 
One of the dauntless soldiers tossed one of these near the windows. It, it emits a signal that you can't hear, but will cause glass to shatter. Okay, I say. And how will that be useful to us? You may find that it's rather distracting for people when all their windows shatter at once, he says, with a small smile, especially in erudite headquarters, where there are a lot of windows. Right, I say. What else have you got, says Christina. The Amity will like this, Kara says. Where is it? Ah, here. She picks up a black box made of plastic, small enough for her to wrap her fingers around it. At the top of the box are two pieces of metal that look like teeth. She flips a switch at the bottom of the box, and a thread of blue light stretches across the gap between the teeth. Fernando, says Kara, want to demonstrate? Are you joking, he says, his eyes wide. I'm never doing that again. You're dangerous with that thing. Kara grins at him and explains, If I touched you with this stunner right now, it would be extremely painful, and then it would disable you. Fernando found that out the hard way yesterday. I made it so that the Amity would have a way of defending themselves without shooting anyone. That's, I frown, understanding of you. Well, technology is supposed to make life better, she says. No matter what you believe, there's a technology out there for you. What did my mother say in that simulation? I worry that your father's blustering about erudite has been to your det deterrent. What if she was right? Even if she was just a part of a simulation. My father taught me to see the erudite a particular way. He never taught me that they made no judgments about what people believed, but designed things for them within the confines of those beliefs. He never told me they could be funny, or that they could critique their own faction from the inside. Kara lunges toward Fernando with a stunner, laughing when he jumps back. He never told me that an erudite could offer to help me, even after I killed her brother. The attack will begin in the afternoon, before it is too dark to see the blue armbands that mark some of the Dauntless's traitors. As soon as our plans are finalized, we walk through the orchard to the clearing where the trucks are kept. When I emerge from the trees, I see that Johanna Rise is, Rise is por perched on the hood of one of the trunks, the keys dangling from her fingers. Behind her waits a small convoy, convoy of vehicles parked with Amity, packed with Amity. But not, not just Amity, because of negation, with their severe hairstyles and still mouths, are among them. Robert, Susan's older brother, is with them. Johanna hops down from the hood. In the back of the trap, she was just sitting on is. Uh, in the back of the truck, she was just sitting on is a stack of crates marked apples and flour and corn. It's a good thing we only have to fit two people in the back. Hello, Johanna, says Marcus. Marcus, she says, I hope you don't mind if we accompany you to the city. Of course not, he says. Lead the way. Johanna gives Marcus the keys and climbs into the bed of one of the other trucks. Christina starts toward the truck cab, and I go for the truck bed, with Fernando behind me. You don't want to sit up front, says Christina, and you call yourself a dauntless. I went for part of the... I went for the part of the truck in which I was least likely to vomit, I say. Puking is a part of life. I'm about to ask her exactly how often she intends to throw up in the future when the truck surges forward. I grab the side, of, side with both hands so I don't fall out, but after a few minutes, when I get used to the bumping and jostling, I let go. The other trucks trundle along in front of us, behind Johanna's, which leads the way. I feel calm until we reach the fence. I expect to counter the same guards who tried to stop us on the way in, but the gate is abandoned, left open. A tremor starts in my chest and spreads to my hands. In the midst of meeting new people and making pl plans, I forgot that my plan is to walk straight into a battle that could claim my life. Right after, I realized that my life was worth living. The convoy slows down as we pass through the fence, like they expect someone to jump out and stop us. Everything is silent apart from the cicate sades in the distant trees and the tr truck engines. Do you think it's already started? I say to Fernando. Perhaps, perhaps not, he says. Janine has many informants. Someone probably told her that something was going to happen, so she called all the dauntless forces back to Ariadite headquarters. I nod, but I'm really thinking of Caleb. He was one of those informants. I wonder why he believed so strongly that the outside world should be hidden from us 
and that he would and that he would betray everyone he's supposed to cared about for Janine. Who cares about no one? Did you ever meet someone named Caleb? I say. Caleb? Fernando says. Yes, there was a Caleb in my initiate class. Brilliant, but he was what's the colloquial term for it? A suck up? He smirks. There was a bit of division between the initiates, those who were those who embraced everything Janine said, and those who didn't. Obviously I was a member of the la of the latter group. Caleb was a member of the former. Why do you ask? I met him while I was imprisoned, I say, and my voice sounds far away even to me. I was just curious. I wouldn't judge him too harshly, says Fernando. Janine can be extraordinarily persuasive to those who aren't naturally suspicious. I have also, I have always been naturally suspicious. I stare over his left shoulder at the skyline that gets clearer and closer as we get to the city. I hear, I search for the two prongs at the top of the hub, and when I find them, I feel better and worse at the same time. Better, because the building is so familiar, and worse, because seeing the prongs means that we are getting closer. Yeah, I say. So have I. Chapter 41 By the time we reach the city, all conversation has halted in the trap, replaced by pressed lips and pale faces. Marcus steers around potholes the size of a person and parts down broken and parts from bar broken down buses. The ride is smoother when we get out of the factionless territory and into the clean parts of the city. Then, I hear gunshots. From this distance, they sound like popping. For a moment, I am disoriented, and all I can see are the leaders of abnegation on their knees on the pavement, and the slack-faced Dauntless, with guns in hand. All I see is my mother turning to embrace the bullets, and Will dropping to the ground. I bite my fist to keep from crying out, and the pain brings me back to the present. My mother told me to be brave, but if she had known that her death would make me so afraid, would she have sacrificed herself so willingly? Breaking away from the convoy of trucks, Marcus turns on Madison Avenue, and when we are just two blocks away from and when we are just two blocks away from Michigan Avenue, where the fighting is, he pulls the truck into an alley and turns off the engine. Fernando hops out of the truck bed and offers me his arm. Come on, insurgent, he says with a wink. What? I say. I take his arm and slide down the side of the truck. He opens the bag he was sitting with, and is full of blue clothes. He sorts through them, tossing garments to Christina and me. I get a bright blue t-shirt and a pair of blue jeans. Insurgent, he says. Now, a person who acts in opposition to the established authority, who is not necessarily regarded as belligerent. Do you need to give everything a name, says Kara, running her hands over her dull blonde hair to tuck the stray pieces back. We're just doing something and it happens to be in a group. No need for a new title. I just happen to enjoy categorization. Fernando replies, arching a dark eyebrow. I look at Fernando. The last time I broke into a faction's headquarters, I did it with a gun in hand, and I left bodies behind me. I want this time to be different. I need this time to be different. I like it, I say. Insurgent, it's perfect. See, Fernando says to Kara, I'm not the only one. Congratulations, she says wryly. I stare at my erudite clothes while the others strip off their outer layers of clothing. No time for modesty, Stiff, Christina says, giving me a pointed look. I know she's right, so I pull off the red shirt I was wearing and put on the blue one instead. I glance at Fernando and Marcus to make sure they aren't watching, and change out of my pants, too. I have to roll up the jeans four times, and when I belt them, they bunch at the top like the neck of a crushed paper bag. Did she just call you Stiff? Fernando says. Yeah, I say. I transferred into Dauntless from Abnegation. Huh, he frowns. That's quite a shift. That kind of leap in personality between generations is almost genetically impossible these days. Sometimes personality has nothing to do with the person's choice of faction, I say, thinking of my mother. She left Dauntless not because she was ill-suited for it, but because it was safer to be divergent in abnegation. And then there's Tobias, who switched to Dauntless to escape his father. There are many factions to consider. To escape the man I have made my ally... I feel a twinge of guilt. Keep talking like that and they'll never discover you're not really erudite, Fernando says. I run a comb through my hair to smooth it down and then tuck it behind my ears. Here, says Kara. She lifts a piece of hair from my face and pins it back with a silver hair clip, the way erudite girls do. Christina takes out the guns we brought with us and looks at me. Do you want one, she says, or would you rather carry the stunner? 
I stare at the gun in her hand. If I don't take the stun, if I don't take the stunner, I leave myself completely undefended against people who will gladly shoot me. If I do, I admit to weakness in front of Fernando, Kara, and Marcus. You know what Will would say, says Christina. What? I say, my voice breaking. He would tell you to get over it, she says. To stop being so irrational and take the stupid gun. Will had little patience for the irrational. Christina must be right. She knew him better than I did. And she, who lost someone dear to her that day, just as I did, was able to forgive me, an act that must have been nearly impossible. It would have been impossible for me if the situation was reversed. So why is it so difficult for me to forgive myself? I closed my hand around the gun Christina offered me. The metal is warm from where she touched it. I feel the memory of shooting him, poking at the back of my mind, and try to stifle it. But it wouldn't be sti- but it won't be stifled. I let go of the gun. The stunner is a perfectly good option, Kara says as she plucks a hair from her sh- from her shirt sleeve. If you ask me, the Dauntless are too gun happy anyways. Fernando offers me the stunner. I wish I could communicate my gratitude to Kara, but she isn't looking at me. How am I going to conceal this thing? I say. Don't bother, Fernando says. Right. We'd better go, says Marcus, glancing at his watch. My heart beats so hard it marks every second for me, but the rest of me is numb. I can barely feel the ground. I've never been this afraid before, and considering all that I've seen in simulations and all that I did during the attack simulation, that doesn't make any sense. Or maybe it does. Whatever the, ab- the abnegation we're about to show everyone before the attack, it was enough to make Janine take drastic and terrible measures to stop them. And now I am about to finish their work, the work my old faction died for. So much more than my life is at stake now. Christina and I lead the way. We run down the clean, even sidewalks, even sidewalks on Madison Avenue, passing State Street toward Michigan Avenue. Half a block from Erudite headquarters, I come to a sudden stop. Standing in, four ro- standing in four rows in front of us are a group of people, mostly dressed in black and white, spaced two feet apart, guns held up and ready. I blink, and they become simulation-controlled Dauntless in the abnegation sector during the simulation attack. Get a grip! Get a grip! A grip! Get a grip! I blink again, and they are the candor again. Some of them, dressed, in, dressed all in black, do look like Dauntless. If I'm not careful... I'll lose touch with where I, with where and when I am. Oh my God, Christina says. My sister, my parents. What if they... She looks at me, and I think I know her thoughts, because I've experienced them before. Where are my parents? I have to find them. But if her parents are like these candor, simulation controlled and armed, there is nothing she can do for them. I wonder if Lynn stands in one of these rows somewhere else. What do we do? Fernando asks. I step forward toward the t- candor. Maybe they aren't programmed to shoot. I stare into a, the glazed eyes of a woman in, bla- in a white blouse and black slacks. She looks like she just came from work. I take another step. Bang! By instinct, I drop to the ground, covering my head with my arms, and scramble backward toward Fernando's shoes. He helps me to my feet. How about let's not do that, he says. I lean forward, not too far, and peer into the alley between the building next to us and the Erudite headquarters. The Candor are in the alley, too. I wouldn't be surprised if they if there was a dense layer of Candor surrounding the entire complex of, er- of the Erudite building. buildings. Is there any other way to Erudite headquarters, I say? Not that I know of, says Kara, unless you want to jump from one roof to another. She laughs a little as she says it, like it's a joke. I raise my eyebrows at her. Wait, she says. You aren't considering roof, I say. No, windows. I walk to the left, careful not to add advance even an inch toward the candor. The building on my left overlaps with the erudite erudite headquarters on its far left side. There There have to be a few windows that face each other. Kara mutters something about crazy dauntless stunts. And ru- but runs after me, and Fernando, Marcus, and Christina follow. I try to open the back door of the building, but it's locked. Christina steps forward and says, Stand back. She points her gun at the lock. I shield my face with an arm as she fires. We hear a loud bang, and then a high ringing. 
and the after effects of, a fi of firing a gun in such close space. The lock is broken. I pull the door open and walk inside. A long hallway with tile floor greets me, doors on either side. Some opened, some closed. When I look into the open rooms, I see rows of old desks and chalkboards on the walls like the ones in Dauntless Headquarters. The air smells musty, like the pages of a library book mixed with cleaning solution. This, this used to be a commercial building, says Fernando, but Erudite converted it into a school for post-choosing education. After the major renovations in an Erudite headquarters about a decade ago, you know, when all the buildings across from, from Millennium were connected, they stopped teaching there. Too old, hard to update. Thanks for the history lesson, says Christina. When I, reach to, when I reach the end of the hallway, I walk into one of the classrooms to see where I am. I see the back of Erudite headquarters, but there are no windows across the alley at the street, at street level. Right outside the window, so close it, I could touch her if I stretched my hand through the window, is a candor child, a girl, holding a gun that is as long as her forearm. She stands so still I wonder if she's even breathing. I crane my neck to see the windows above the street level. Over my head in the school building, there are plenty of windows. At the back of, the, of Erudite headquarters, there is only one that lines up, and it's on the third story. Good news, I say. I found a way across. End of chapter 41.